Hello everyone, I'm Daz and welcome to American Civil War and UK History. This presentation is available as a video on our YouTube channel and as a podcast from wherever you get your podcasts from. And remember on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. And remember if you're watching on YouTube to hit that subscribe button. Okay, joining me today is my very good friend and co-founder of our charitable institution of ours, which is Monuments for UK Veterans of the American Civil War Association, Gina Denham. Welcome, Gina. Hi, Daz. Nice to see you. Today's discussion is about the man who founded the London branch of US Civil War veterans and his life during the American Civil War, none other than John Davis. So, okay, Gina, could you start with telling us a little bit about John Davis's early life? I'm a big fan of John Davis. Now, hopefully this isn't going to be like mastermind um i might have to make a few references uh, to uh, written material about him and fortunately there is quite a wealth of information about him uh the reverend codling uh produced a booklet in the late 1890s called the marvel of mercy and uh, the london city mission were kind enough to send me a copy so some of the material that i'm going to be talking about today comes from that and press releases etc so john davis um, was an Englishman and he was born on the November the 23rd, 1839, and in a small village called Meonstoke, which is near Bishop's Walpham in Hampshire. So for those of you who are overseas, Hampshire is based in the southern part of England. There are ports there, etc. Now, John Davis, his father, was a mole catcher and John was one of nine children. Um, he had two older siblings who were girls. And long and short of it John wasn't uh gonna be he wasn't it wasn't in his temperament to work the land um the Reverend Cod Codlind uh referenced that in his book about John uh he said nature had never intended it he was active and he was enterprising and he wanted to get away and a bit like some of the other veterans that you and I have come across in our last couple of years in the work that we're doing he answered to the call of the sea. So that's about John Davis in very earlier on. Tell me where you want to, do you want to know more? Yes, please. All right. So he, he obviously becomes very restless. He's got this adventurous spirit and he doesn't really want to be caged by the limits of a small village in Victoria, England. So he joins uh, a merchant vessel at Fairham in Hampshire but it was only a short-lived experience, to be honest, because he found himself in an Amer in America, and he was running kind of uh, the kind of the merchant trade between Halifax and uh, Boston in the U.S. Now he was still a young man. He's born in, so he's arrived in North America in the 1850s, and there you go. What's that? Manhattan Island. Oh yes. Um, he, so he arrives in North America. So primarily, he's, he's in Boston. But you can imagine he's part of a, a young guy on a ship full of old sea salts and sea warriors, and he soon turns to drink. And um, I can quote this because this is quite a nice quote from the, the Reverend Codlin. Leaving his ship at Boston, he went to a sailor's boarding house and got mixed up with some of the very rakings of hell. His money was soon all gone credit he had none and a destitute condition he fell amongst the loafers down at the wolf men who would dare or do anything for five cents worth of whiskey soon he became so hard up that he was glad to pick up bits of dirty refuse biscuit thrown ashore from the ships onto the dust heaps in order to allay the cravings of hunger so this is John, he's still in the merchant service. Yeah, the drink was a very much part of his early years. You want to know what? <laughs> yeah, so what I would love to know is why why, and how, you know, why does he end up going to the US? Because you said, I, mean, I remember before we came on the camera, you mentioned that he had a very similar, you know, uh, um, story yeah. to George you know yeah I mean he was just a young guy he was but he was I mean he was born 1839 so he's born four years after George Denham 
George Denham, as you know, is my great great grandfather, ran away to America in 1856. Very similar stories. Um, big families, uh, s- a number of siblings. And, you know, from everything that I've gathered about John Davis, he wasn't going to be bound by working as an agricultural labourer in Victorian England. He, You can tell by his temperament, even as the founder of the London Raj, this guy was a mover and shaker. You know, I would have loved to have met him. He really was a man, you know, who, who, who he could have fitted very well into the 21st century in terms of the way he manipulated and exploited the social media at the time to to the, to the veteran's advantage, not in a, a you know, a, a, an offhand or inappropriate way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so he, he's gone to North America, but he's working in the merchant service, first of all. And obviously, if you found that he, he finds himself, he's bad, you know, he's, 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 he's um, <clears throat> started drinking. He's a young guy. And he basically a captain in Liverpool because he eventually starts crossing uh, the Atlantic and he goes to Liverpool a couple of times. And a captain in Liverpool took pity on him and changed his company and put him onto a ship called the Benares, uh, or ben- B-E-N-A-R-E-S, which was based out of Boston. And then John uh, goes out to um, China, Shanghai, uh, what was then Vietnam as well, as I understand it. Um, and eventually he he goes back to uh, Liverpool and to make a very long story short, he realises he gets, um, he finds himself in very difficult circumstances in Liverpool and he realises he couldn't go home. Now, so he gets on a vessel and he heads for what your, that image that you're displaying there, for Manhattan Island, he enters New York City, Brooklyn, and when he arrives, he finds the city in turmoil because it started, it's the start of the American Civil War. So he joins the Union Navy in 1862. And why not? If you think about it, for the same reason, he gets a uniform, he gets board and lodgings, and he, he gets a roof over his head. So he joins the Union Navy in 1862 and he goes on the receiving ship, uh, the North Carolina, uh, which is the same ship that George Denham and many other of the London branch veterans um, all um, went on as a receiving ship, certainly if they were in Brooklyn. Um, and in that, I guess that one became one of the common denomin- mm-hmm. denominators of the conversations they had with each other. Do, so, do yeah. You- do you think they ever crossed paths in that early stage of the of the war? Yeah, or, I mean, uh, uh, John Davis. Yeah, John Davis claimed to have met Edward Munro, who at one mm-hmm. time was apparently one of the oldest American Civil War veterans alive um, at the time. And Edward Munro would have been was li- started living back in like he was born in Nova Scotia himself, funny enough, uh, where John Davis had actually been working as a young merchantman on a vessel. Um, but he, John Davis said that he did meet um, Edward Munro during his earlier service. But whilst I can't remember to particular individuals, um, when, I, when I've gone through pension files, you'll find that some of the veterans did meet each other during their Civil War service. But because the North Carolina was a receiving ship, you know, John Taplin went on it. Uh, George Denham went on it. They all went on that vessel. Sometimes it was for days. Sometimes it was for several weeks. Uh, in John Davis's case, he went on there and he remained on that vessel for several weeks. And he's actually given a quite a good description of it. He says, what, what an awful gambling hell she was. I've seen men who owned $1,000 at four o'clock in the afternoon. And before 10 that night, they had played for the very shirt on their own back. So this was John Davis's. So where are we now? 1862. He's born in 1839, 59. So he's still in his early 20s by, by that stage. And he's now in this awful gambling hell of the USS and North Carolina. And um, 
yeah, he wasn't entirely happy with his experiences, for sure. He, he, he kind of wanted to get back to England, away from the racket of men who were drunk, cursing all the time, swearing in almost every tongue known to man. He said that he was like the Tower of Babel gone mad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess if you think about Pretty it... interesting, yeah. Yeah, well, if you think about it, those veterans, when they did eventually reunite in 1910 in Bermondsey when John formed the London branch, probably had that as a common den- dominator. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got a shared it, lived experience, why not? You're going to be talking about it. And so his uh, first experience, sorry, at, like serving, was actually um, during the Vicks, Vicksburg campaign as well. That was one of his campaigns. Yeah, so, is that yeah. Right, on a Malta boat, is that right? Yeah, he so he go so he's on he's on the Potomac River. Uh, oh, sorry, he went down to the mouth of, mouth of the Mississippi River and for six days and nights was in battle at Fort Jackson and Fort Phillip. Um, and then he he was involved in the vessels opening fire on the Confederate fleet. Um, then he did some duty on the Potomac River um, with patrol duties, etc. So he's still so, yeah, he's, throwing from the theatres then. So he's gone yeah, yeah. out west and then he comes back east. So he gets yeah. around a bit then, doesn't he, in that early stage? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, he's, I mean, John, as, I mean, I, my, my, I like John Davis because of his probably his post war experiences in terms of how after he became a missionary, after his kind of, when he, he, he found God and how he kind of really, I don't know, just everything about him. Oh, you know, the, you, you know, sometimes you meet people in history and you think, oh, I'd love to meet that person. I'd love to have met John Davis. It's quite nice to be able to meet some of his descendants now to feel a sense of connection with him. But, yeah, so he, he's seen a bit of America. Obviously, he's joined almost the start of the American Civil War and he said that New York was in turmoil, Um you know, and I suppose New York, Brooklyn, Naval Yard was where a lot of the, uh, the veterans that you and I have got to know about found themselves and why they joined the US Navy. It offered them an opportunity. So, yeah, George certainly, I'm um, sorry, uh, John Davis certainly had some action. Um, he he gets appointed as a, uh, as a master's mate in 1864, and that's when he was transferred to the, uh, the gunboat, the USS Tulip. Um, is that it? Is that the truly? Ah, uh, oh. from what I understand, yes. <clears throat> yeah. From my Google search that picture came up. So um, yeah. I, I believe that is the the actual vessel itself. If it's not, I do apologise, ladies and gentlemen. But that's what yeah. came up. So yeah. yeah, I'm gonna have to refer to it now. I don't know if you've got a picture of no. The there's a whilst you may not see it here. This is. A I, I, I have got that picture uh, in a slide uh, in a second. So okay. I'll, uh, yeah. Once you explain the story. Yeah. So John Davis. So he, he's um, uh, he's now on the the gunboat USS Tulip. He's got a bit of responsibility. Oh, there it is. So he. This is the lead up. What you're seeing there is his report concerning. Um, the the explosion of the boilers on the USS Tulip. So he's at Pine Point, which lies at the mouth of Chesapeake Bay. And there was a huge camp there that was formed of uh, Confederate prisoners. And it was there that the Tulip was ordered to go and perform uh, a guard duty. Now move forward to 11th of November, 1864, and the tulip um, started for the Navy Yard at Washington, D.C. Now, according to John, and I quote, there was 109 miles to run. Um, and he took the first dog watch and relieved, was relieved at 6.10 p.m. His two hours on deck had somewhat sobered him. So instead of going down below where he could hear the fellows shouting and singing, He went as far aft as he could get and stood by the taffrail. He had a feeling that something would happen. He knew that they were cracking on on with leaky boilers that were bound to go and they might do so at any minute. Now, 
orders had been issued anyway that extreme care should have been taken in the use of getting up steam on that vessel. Uh, the pork boiler was not to be used as well as it wouldn't bear any pressure and they were to really travel very, very slowly, taking plenty of time. And of course, um, you know, you've got what you've got John's report there and I'll probably read that in a minute. But that's when the explosion occurred. And if you think about it, John, there it is. Now, that image is taken from uh, the souvenir, a uh, souvenir of the London branch, which, uh, which was produced about 1912. I'd love to get a copy. Um, now, that illustration, we're not sure. I don't know if it was done by John Davis, but you can see what he's written around the edge. It is nearly 50 years ago since that awful night. I hear their cries and groans still. Um, 57 were blown to pieces or drowned that night. And John Davis was one of the few survivors. And it's actually quite sad. I'm kind of reminded a little bit of these kind of these movies where, you know, you know something bad's going to happen. The, the the hot water from the and steam from the bursting boilers had scalded many of the crew. So the, you can imagine that the, the few survivors anyway, the ones who literally are not blown to smithereens, find themselves in the water because it's really cold and it's really salty. The pain of the salt on their burns just obviously it increases their you know their their ex, mm. expletives, their shouting, their screaming. It's in the in the darkness. And a big passenger steamer goes by, so they're shouting out for help. But because of the noise of, and of the machinery on the vessel, and there's a band and there's a dance, and it drowns out John Davis's voice and that of his few surviving comrades, and it and it obviously proceeds on its way. So John's now in that water, you know, with these other you know burnt and injured few survivors of the vessel i mean you look, look if you look at that image i mean it doesn't really need not much needs to be said about that really it's quite a powerful image actually yeah yeah and if you think about it yeah. there is a monument to the uss tulip uh which um was um, cited several years ago um and i believe one of john davis's descendants has been out there i'm not sure um but yeah, and I mean, Jay Rarick, who uh, kind of supports us in our work, who's a, who's a member of the American Legion, um, has told us as well, because I think it, where, where he lives, it's not that far. So he signposted us to that as well. So if anybody's, um, you know, watching this, who's got an interest in with the USS Tulip, then yeah, to get, get out there, go and have a look at the monument. I've seen it. It's quite a nice one as well. It's, it's, it's not one of these kind of ones that you could blink and you'd miss it. it it's quite nice. So, yeah, so they're, they're stuck in the water there. You know, can you imagine as well? Don't forget, this is 11th of November. This isn't summertime. Mm -hmm. But that water's going to be cold as well. So they're, they're in the river. And then a tug steamer, which had been towing two, uh, two barges, has obviously seen the explosion, and it sails into the middle of the wreckage and uh, picks up, I think, uh, different reports, because one says 10, 10 survivors. John Davis, is, uh, he, he, ma he maintains it was seven survivors. But anyhow, of the seven, only three survive. So joint wing, which includes John Davis. Now, on that previous slide, um, you had the report there, Daz, and I think I've got a copy of it. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So obviously he says it's uh, 11 o'clock, sorry, 3 o'clock on the, the morning. They left uh, St. Egan at Enigo's Naval Station. And then obviously they, they proceed at 6 p.m. when John Davis was relieved. So at 16 minutes past six, I was on the fore part of the vessel, heard some noise and excitement in the engine room and saw volumes of steam uh, come up from the engine and fire room hatchways. And he was quite actually on point here because in his own account in the late 1890s and in this account from the 1860s, the narrative is exactly the same as well because he says, or he said that engineer Parks rushed down the engine room and engineer Gordon cried out, for God's sake, somebody raised a safety valve. Well, of course, it was too late. And seeing there was danger, I came abreast of the cabin companion, uh, a cabin companion wave. The explosion occurred. 
and the after part of the vessel went down in about two minutes. Um, I don't know if there's a hierarchy in the type of vessel you want uh, if you're in the Navy to get on. As you know, George Den Denham was on a USS Chickasaw, an ironclad vessel. And uh, some acad academics suggest that if you're on an ironclad, whilst it affords you great protection because it was a clad in iron, it would go down in 10 seconds. So according to this report that John Davis submitted to Commander Parker in November, uh, the next day on November 12th, 1864, it went down in about two minutes. So, so yeah. That came so what, what kind of, obviously, it's going to be horrendous effects uh, mentally yeah. for him afterwards. Yeah. Um, obviously physically as well. Yeah. Um, so, so what was it like for him afterwards, that this, this event, you know, because again, this is going to change your life, isn't it? You know, I think you're on point there, Daz. Because he goes on um, what we used to know in the police when I was a police officer. He went on to uh, restricted duties. Now, he also claims that he got to go and meet the Naval Secretary, Gideon Wells. And so he's put on uh, restricted duties and um, he finds himself at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. Um, and he's given a degree of responsibility. But unfortunately, John also, whilst he's enjoying this responsibility and light duties, he's also enjoying a bit of liquor, liquor as well. And um, unfortunately, he finds himself, um, whilst he's got this position of responsibility in the Navy Depot at Washington. And I guess, to be honest, as he, he is now experiencing either acute trauma, if it's soon after the event, or post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, and it wasn't really recognised in the Civil War because certainly George Denham had the hallmarks of that and pretty much most of the other veterans that you read about had some form of uh, trauma from their lived experience. So, yeah, Dad, um, uh, John Davis is now on uh, restricted duties. He's working at the Navy Department in Washington, D.C., and unfortunately, when he, he had a team of staff that were assigned to do these particular duties where he was based, and unfortunately, they weren't doing it, um, doing what they should have done. And apparently, um, whilst I haven't got the, the, the fine detail of it, he basically gets uh, arrested for not supervising his um you know, the, the, the his staff uh, appropriately. And... Um, he gets taken before Commodore Parker. But it's quite interesting. Again, it gives you a measure of the type of um, individual he was because Commodore Parker basically said, look, I feel quite ashamed of you because you have you felt like a son to me. And um, he basically uh, forgives him. And, and uh, so John gets appointed to a new ship. I'm not sure of the name of the ship, but he basically gets sent afloat. But by all accounts, and I've put PTSD in some of the notes that I made about John when we were looking to do this piece on him today. Um, by mid-April, and we're now looking towards sort of 1865 anyway, PTSD has taken his toll and he, and he resigns from the Union Navy and he, he decides to come back to England and it's quite a contrast in circumstances. Just going to take a gulp here, Daz, in case yeah, you're not asked questions. You go for it. Um, mm. Fascinating story. So, like you said, he's he's going to make his way back to to England, and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, go on. That is the set of circumstances that sees him come back. Then is he's just you know that's enough yeah. for him. Yeah, but it doesn't really end there because what happens is you think now you're great because you've put a picture in him, so he resigns his position in the Union Navy. Now, if you think about it, you know, he's met Gideon Wells, he's met Commodore Parker, who felt that he'd been like a, a son to Commodore Parker, according to the that narrative by Reverend Codlin. And um, so he leaves the, the, the relative ease of the Union uh, Navy. Obviously, the, the, the American the Civil War is now you know, effectively concluded. But if you think about it, going back to the reason perhaps why he joined as he, as it, you know, uh, several years earlier, he got a free uniform and a salary of $1,200 a year. So he resigns 
from those fringe benefits, if you like, of joining, of being in the Union Navy. And he takes his position up on a vessel bound for Bristol. But what a contrast. Because he's now a common sailor. And in, he, basically, this is an image that he's describing. He's got a tar pot around his neck and he's tarring this vessel as it's bound for Bristol for three pounds a month. So he's gone from uniform, position of responsibility, you know, $1,200 a year to three pounds a month. Now, and regardless of whatever the exchange rate is, I think there's a big difference between, you know, carrying the burden of responsibility and carrying a tar pot. Wow, yeah. Yeah, so he, he now arrives in Bristol, but he doesn't like stay there for very long. He decides to go to Australia. Oh, Australia. I thought he was going to yeah. say that. Oh, he gets but, around a bit, this guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, Australia, he's, he's a little bit short-lived. He goes out there, but he does several trips because he's part of the merchant service as well. And um, so he tries his luck at the gold uh, digging business. But in his own words, he said, I was too fond of rum to dig for gold. I couldn't pick it up and I wouldn't dig for it. So he basically comes back to London. And and that really is his kind of final time in London. But again, the Reverend Codlin in this Marvel and Mercy course, kind of describes John Davis has now arrived back in Victoria to Victorian London in sort of 1867 or thereabouts. Do you want me to read it? Because I quite like yes, it. Yes, please. To portray the man as he was, rec reckless, drunken, debauched, wallowing in the mire of his sin, and then in picturing as he is, and obviously this is in the 1890s when the account was written, to magnify the glorious grace of God, which took him out of the pit, saved, sanctified, and filled him with untiring love and unquenchable zeal for the conversion of another perishing soul. So he's obviously gone from, now this is obviously John in the 1890s, um, but he, he wasn't obviously, he comes back to England, he hasn't quit drinking straight away. He's had the American Civil War experience, he's had the tar pot round his neck, He's been unsuccessful in the, you know, the gold rush in Australia. He's come back to um, uh, England. Um, you know, he'd gone off, obviously, mingled with men of all nations. He'd seen the battles. He'd seen shot where a comrade shot down, you know, blown to pieces, etc. And eventually he gets employment um, as a lock uh, gateman in the Southwest India dock. And um, was that position up until 1877. But he had real quite a significant moment in May 1875, which kind of is a milestone for John and perhaps also worthy of talking about here because it's what, what changed him in terms of this young guy who's addicted to drink and all from a to a man who is almost addicted to supporting other people. You want to know what happened? Yes, please. <laughs> Takes another goal. So there's um, uh, an American evangelist who had been born in Massachusetts in 1837 called Dwight L. Moody. Now, apparently, by all accounts, Dwight L. Moody was one of the most um, famous and most impressive uh, evangelists of his time. There's quite a lot, of, quite a lot of information if you Google it. And Dwight Moody um, happened to be in um, London at the time. He was um, uh, he'd been out there for several years. He'd been on a campaign, and basically, John in May 1875. Um, Dwight Sankey is preaching in the East End of London, um, unbeknown to John, he's still addicted to drink. And one night when he's drunk, he, he fell into the dock and he's nearly drowned. Well, I can't imagine what it must have been like jumping into a Victorian dock in London. It's not going to be the most pleasurable of experiences. Anyway, he gets dragged out by somebody who's a, a Christian and he, he's sitting there and he, he he's obviously freezing cold and he's somewhat sobered by the his immersion in the water and his experience. And he's basically sitting on the dock 
and he's he's crying his eyes out. I think he's obviously had that that moment of potential where, where he wants change. So this person who's rescued him and says, look, why don't you go down to uh, this church um, in Bow in East London where Dwight Moody is preaching? So John Davis goes along and that's when he obviously found God. He maintains his position as that gatekeeper, uh, gate, um, house, housekeeper in the docks, but he resigns that position in 1877 and becomes a missionary um, at the Gedling Street or the Ragged School, Bermondsey, uh, which is where you and I visited um, mm-hmm. in Abbey Street, Bermondsey. So he, st- he basically maintains, so he joins that as a missionary in 1877. And whilst there's probably um, got any examples to hand you can find lots of references to john in the sort of 1890s and the early 1900s before the london branch existed talking about how he was quite compassionate and quite a, um you know a, a, a notable good public speaker in terms of how he, he got the attention of the audience that's what i'd like he was made for the job that he did uh-huh. in terms of the london branch um, and obviously, I've got a really good um, yeah, um, uh, description that the Reverend Codling gives of John Davis around the time that uh, my great great grandfather met him. I mean, I can't imagine what it must have felt like when George Denham gets this letter or whatever it was that his encounter um, when he when he met John Davis. And obviously, I've done my homework in how they they got to to me. Um, but yeah, this is John Davis. And look, I love that picture because obviously it fits with the description um, that the Reverend Codlin wrote about him when he was obviously in his 50s and 60s. He says, picture to yourself a man between 50 and 60 years of age, thick set, broad shouldered, slightly under the medium height, his hair close cropped, full moustache, beard long and bushy, strongly tending to grey. A full short neck bears up a well-shaped massive head. The forehead is high and ample. The eyes deep set, small and keen, can twinkle with mirth and look into a troubled face with tender pity or on very rare occasions flash with the fires of a righteous anger. And I think actually, from what I've gathered, John Davis's approach in terms of, you know, he, he found God was probably quite um he had a, he was able to kind of you know bring people into the fold rather than being this kind of fire and brimstone type preacher i get the sense that he he, he had a quite a um how would i put it like a like a, he, he, he could get your interest even if you didn't mm-hmm. have faith i think he could get your interest because of the way he was i do have a question about that so obviously he finds this faith and in, in god yeah so do you think that helps him when it comes to um, dealing with what experiences he went through, particularly, you know, with the tulip and stuff like that? Yeah, that made yeah, def- it, yeah that I think. Him in a way, do you think? Yeah, well, I, if you think about it, um, in terms of lived experience, and you think about, I always think about the um, the Royal Marines who came back from the Falklands Islands. It was the the ones who came back on the ships after the, the campaign in the Falklands Islands were able to kind of work through some of their trauma by sh- speaking to their comrades on the vessel. Whereas those crew, those people who served in the Falklands Islands who flew back had a poorer experience of mental health because they weren't able to decompress and share their experiences. That is why I think John Davies is such an important character. Even though by 1910, 50 years had passed, he was able to do what nobody else had done. There was no Grand Army of the Republic posts in the United Kingdom. Uh, Joseph Emerson Yule had tried it up in um, Lancashire in um, the summer of 1909. He'd gone out there, had been tasked by the Grand Army of the Republic with badges and a charter to start a post. But somehow he didn't do it. John Davis did. But yet, how does John Davis end up 
you know, is that mm. because of his experience he wanted to share it with other people, or is it because yeah. he's mixing with these other guys that he knew served in the, you know, yeah. in the American Civil War? So come on, let. So how does that all go about? How does the formation of the London Rochester U.S. Civil War veterans happen? Okay, good point. So basically, this is John Davis used to meet up with these veterans at the consulate, and he, and, he, and this is his quote from about 1910 when he said you know like why why we started it he said many a time when i have met some of my comrades at a consulate and we have said why can't we get a little closer in touch with one another we are getting old and frequently our dead do not have the honor of the american flag being laid over their graves so i thought we should try and form some form of society of our own whereby we might have the opportunity of meeting each other at stated intervals so he's obviously he's meeting these veterans um he um i'm not sure if he met edward munro as i mentioned earlier but he certainly met these veterans and he's obviously indicated where one of the places where he met them um now let's have a look oh here we go so jo um uh a Arthur W. Uh, Fraser Smith, who became now I don't know. Yeah, you will banner. Let's see if I can see it. Hang on. So in that bigger picture, Daz, on the far right hand side, you can just see him wearing. Um, it's Arthur Fraser Smith. So he's right that big London branch picture you're showing. There's um a, yeah just there you can see he's wearing the honourable set. That's yeah. So that's Arthur. William Fraser Smith. Now that picture you're looking at from memory was taken in about 1917. John Davis isn't in it because John Davis at that point has passed away. He passed away on the 5th of January 1917. So John um, Arthur William Fraser Smith, who was born in Coventry in 1847, he's also a missionary, missionary for the London City Mission. And he takes over where John Davis left off. But in quite a nice eulogy to John Davis and around, again, why John Davis started the London branch, because I've always got the why. Why did he do it? Um, so he said that the prime mover was Ensign John Davis, a London city missionary who found such comfort with his American pension that he tried to assist others in their claims. He rounded up 137 veterans of the Civil War who in, whom he enrolled and aided them in securing pensions. The highest membership of this organisation was 146 and the additional nine have returned to America. So Arthur wrote this in 1927. Of the original membership, only 13 now survive and they are all over 80 years of age. But again, another little indication, the prime mover. John Davis, we you know we'd get the, the utilised press to disclose the activities in the London branch, etc. So he he's met these uh, veterans. Many of them were in the workhouses. Um, there's some accounts where if he he couldn't um, uh, if they didn't have any lodgings, he let let them live with him and his family in Blue Anchor Lane in Bermondsey. Um, I mean, I'm just off the top of my head. There's an account, um, I think it's from about 1913 when he gets robbed on a bus. And it, but rather than, and he, there's a small article and he, he kind of talks about to the robbers, look, if you come and meet me, I'm not going to, you know, admon uh, um, kind of punish you. I'll kind of, you know, I'll help you if you, if you need to rob people, et cetera. Um, yeah, this is why, again, you read these little accounts, you think, oh, he, he, he must have had that passion because what he then did uh, in the and what how did he bring these men together so uh, he's met some of them in the consulate he's met some of the workhouses but by all accounts what he then did do um he basically wrote to 80 veterans in london with this idea of forming some form of association and 60 answer his call initially and if you look at that first ever London branch card from uh, 1910 where George Denham's mentioned James Cleggett William Blasey all the people I know in the London branch uh, they're all listed as members Morris Wagg Medal of Honor recipient who's in that picture there on the left you can probably just 
uh, yeah, if you go to the far left of that screen, you can yeah, yeah just go up, do a little that's the right, right, a little bit. You're up, just down, and you will see there it goes. Little to the left, you'll see is lovely. Your that's it. There's his Medal of Honor. Can you just see it? It's very mm-hmm. small, but that's Morris Wag, but just there in old age. So um, yeah, so he forms the London branch. 28 answered a call on September the 20th, 1910, uh, down in Bermondsey. And, um, yeah, they band together and, and formed the association, um, which was in the building known as the Bermondsey Ragged School, which obviously you and I have been to. Yes, so I was going to say that. So um, the next slide is obviously um, of... Um, yep. Um the, the, the railway arches in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. Um, so d- just tell us about that first meeting and because on the next slide I do have the some was this from the first meeting is that right these that, uh, um, no that paperwork from memory is April 1913 because they're um, depending on what because that's two sides of it and it makes reference to Richard Townley Booth who was uh, an American Civil War veteran. American born, who um, was part of the Blue Ribbon Temperance Movement, because obviously, don't forget, John Davis is obviously a missionary now, and he, he's not drinking. So when he met Richard Townley Booth, who also became a London branch member, um, he's he was referenced in this particular paperwork. So that that paperwork you see there, um, that was kindly, um, yeah, that one came from the... Um, Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Um, so obviously quite rare material. So um, what was that other slide that you just had there? I was just going to... Sorry, which one? Yeah, the one before. Yeah, so they, there you go. So you've got... If you look at the top of that right-hand picture, there's several examples of that. We can't, unfortunately, get a better copy of it, but you can see John Davis in it. Um, in the bottom right hand, in the t- in that top photograph, I um, have got a better slide of that one. Oh, okay. Here we go. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. So if you um, you can see um, Seth Herrick, who was an officer in the Mer- oh, there you go. So he's got Colonel Herrick. So Seth Herrick and John Davis are sat next to each other. Now, unfortunately, because that picture's so blurred, um, you can't really identify anybody else in there, but. All I do know, Daz, is among those men is George Denham, because mm-hmm. he was one of the oldest veterans apparently there on that meeting. And I was quite happy to discover that because it meant a lot to me that he was member eight of the London branch and he was there and he answered the call when John Davis put the call out. I can't imagine what George Denham was thinking as he made his way down from Kentish Town um, and walked over perhaps... Uh, the Tower Tower Bridge, as you and I did. And then if you think about it, walk those few streets, uh, what is now known as Tooley Street, to where that railway arch that you've shown on that previous yeah. slide was. It's only a short distance, isn't it? We've done it. So why, why the media interest at the time? Do you know that? I mean, I don't know if you know that or not, because obviously you've got this other... Yeah. You know, I don't know what meeting this one is, but um, that's the same meeting. Yeah, that one. Meeting. Yes. So what, why? Why the interest from the media? Do you think? I, I don't know. It's quite unique, isn't it? I yeah. Suppose. Yeah. If you think about it, it definitely is yeah. unique. I mean, that picture there, I can tell on the left hand side, standing up, that's John Davis, and directly below him is William Blaze, who served in the Connecticut artillery. Uh, but sadly, again, I can't really ID these other veterans. It's just such poor quality. I've got a feeling that Seth Herrick directly, st- um, where just in front of where John Davis is standing. But yeah, I think the way those articles were written, John Davis wrote them, and he's obviously sent them out to the press. I see. Yeah. Yeah, and and got the interest, and it's interesting because that that cut that press cut in there came from a newspaper up in Liverpool, and again I only found that several months ago. So again, different newspapers had different levels of interest, as you and I have found in, in the monumental project. Some people are interested in what we do, 
So he was trying to raise awareness, I suppose, yeah. of of the, the you know the fact that these guys had all fought in the Civil War. Yeah, definitely. And, you know that th this was going on. You know, I think yeah. it's fantastic. I, I would like to move on um, to to our visit there, obviously, because here we yeah. are. You know, we, yeah. Uh, I mean, we wasn't a hundred percent sure when we had the correct arch when we got yeah. there, was we? We, um, but. You know, so you'll see a picture of us holding a beer there with um. I'm sorry, Jeff, I can't remember. Jeff. Jeff Fairburn. Jeff Fairburn. Now, Jeff, Jeff is is a historian. Um, from um, is he from that area or um, researched well, the area? Yeah, Jeff. We got we got to know Jeff because um, I joined the Southwark local history oh, Facebook yeah. page and I posted up. And Jeff very kindly did his own particular research, and we obviously promoted that we were doing this walking in the footsteps of the London branch American Civil War veterans to, and blow me down, higher powers at work, perhaps, mm -hmm. I don't know, but blow me down, me and you are sat in that railway arch. And do you know what, can I just give you a quick description because of yes. the, 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 how the railway arch was described yes, at the time yeah. by the Reverend Colin. Now it was re re referred to by John Davis as the telescope. And um, so I'm just going to plug my uh, think the laptop nearly. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so he, he John Davis calls it the, the telescope. Why does he call it that? Well, as you can see, it's very, those arches are quite narrow. What are they? Probably uh, a vehicle's uh, length in, in width. They're not, they're not particularly wide. And this account from Marvel and Mercy gives you an indication. So... The, the 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 London branch or the ragged um, school mission in Bermondsey was uh, the, just off of Abbey Street, still there today, and it's a railway arch lined with corrugated iron. Well, look at that picture. Now, obviously, that's not the original corrugated metal because they apparently replace it, every, you know, every sort of several years, and it runs under the South Eastern London and Brighton railways. It was one hundred and twenty feet by 20 feet wide and the length being so disproportionate to the width that john davis christened it the telescope and to give an indication of where it was and this is where jeff kindly came into his own there were two smaller arches leading off at right angles so those arches lead into what we posit is Gedlin Street itself. Gedlin Street's been renamed now. Um, so if you're, with that image you've got of me holding up that, the London branch meeting from 1910, the those two arches, the two narrow ones, um, go off to, um, they're sort of behind me. Um, and we saw them, if you recall, when we went in mm -hmm. there. You, the thing that I liked about it, and I can't, re I can't find it in... Uh, uh, the Marvel and Mercy account, but I've read about it somewhere where they would talk about these sermons at the mission and without doubt those uh, uh, musters that the London branch had as well being kind of slightly drowned out by the rumble of trains going overhead. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if you remember when we sucked our first pint and we were about to do a video or whatever and a, a train one ball does it and it kind of went over it and I was like wow you know we're kind of living a bit of history here because that those sounds can't change can't they the, the, the surroundings might change but those sounds can't change etc so that was quite not I don't know you know quite a little nice nod to to why yeah, we were there definitely. that was that was what they was hearing you know yeah. that's what was great about that experience yeah yeah um, but yeah I think they seemed to line up didn't it that day mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and it, the odd thing is, because as I say, with the best guess, we we do believe it's my, this microbrewery um, houses uh, the London branch HQ. And if it's not that arch, it's probably the next one along. It, this is the next best guess. There was a, a memorial um, placed at that um uh, in the arch in 1907, but where it, it could just have been a plaque on the wall. But where if that if that's hidden behind that corrugated metal, then that would confirm that's where the London branch were. But you know, within a hundred feet, we're, we're we're walking in the footsteps there of those London branch veterans. We're walking, you know, with them in their part. You know, they, they, those in their, their footsteps. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, good experience. Very yeah, much enjoyed that. And again, in total, how many members were there uh, in the end of the London branch there? Uh, so we do, yeah, just over 140, yeah, 137. Some of them were, um, uh, there were 49 or thereabouts left in 1927. Um, so in that picture where you've got some of my, some of my favourites there, you've got John Davis at the top left. You've got um, Mor- uh, Morris, uh, yep, yeah, Morris Wag is in that middle picture at the top. You've got Joseph Nash just peeking in the background, who is on the USS Gem of the Sea. You've got Samuel Proops, is that very tall gentleman in the middle with the uh, um, small moustache. You've got Edward Munro at the top right. Looking at the bottom, middle uh, middle left, that's the, sem- that's the um, funeral of Edward Munro. And to the left of his coffin, you've got John Locke, um and to the right you've got john davis and if you can just see john davis has got that flag that says gone home okay. that flag that first reference to that flag where it said gone home and apparently the other side said in memory was when one of the um uh, um uh, white lord reed who was an Amer- american ambassador uh, passed away in 1912 and the London branch escorted his coffin as it left England and went to the United States. But that first reference to that flag gone home and in, in memory is made in 1912. Um, that picture on the right hand side, I'll just give you a quick reference again. These are all so the one on the right hand side, John Davis has now passed away. You've got Samuel Proops in it, William Blazy. That memorial in the background um, with a bit of detective work is just, we, you and I haven't visited it, but it's just um, uh, west of Westminster Abbey. And that's a memorial to the Crimean War. Um, so that one, I can't remember when that was taken. I think it's about 1921. And just finish off, bottom left, William Hines, lived for most of his life in North America, came from Hertfordshire, returned and became a London branch member. And of course, then you've got our, the lovely London branch banner in the middle at the bottom, um, which I guess was the work of um, uh, Arthur William Fraser Smith, who I've already pointed out is in that picture, because that banner you don't see when John Davis is alive. So I, I suspect, you know, again, without any corroborative material, but I suspect best guess, um, um, Arthur William Fraser Smith was responsible. I mean, he was equally, um, he, whilst he described John Davis as the prime mover of the London branch behind its creation, Arthur William Fraser Smith was no, no less um proactive in his tenacity and his efforts to promote a London branch and he's a great source of information as well and the good news is I've managed to track down one of his descendants who's interested in the work that we're doing oh wow that's cool yeah and then finally without further ado James Henry Cleggett born in Rochester 1845 a free-born African-American uh could read and write and for some reason at the age of 16 his reasons never ever disclosed. He decides to join the US Navy before the Emancipation Proclamation. He was working in Boston and at 16 he goes on board the USS Morning Light. Um, now you imagine at that time as a young 16 year old, a black guy joining the US Navy, headed, you know, to headed down. There were some horror stories of the way the Confederates treated African American uh prisoners in the war so a real leap of faith and um john um james cleggett came to london in about 1901 and i suspect he obviously he must have met john davis um and they they really capitalized on james cleggett's pen, pension file application um because curiously whether there was this racism at the time james cleggett's pension file is much thicker than some of his white counterparts. I don't know why. He could verify his service. That he never joined in a fake name or anything like that. But it took him several years and his file was de- he's definitely much bigger. So I'm a big fan of James Cleggett because I know what he went through. And he was, again, another prime mover 
uh, in formation of the London branch. I think he was member, oh goodness, I think he was member 11 of the London branch. Um, but he was in, he was definitely one of the founding fathers. Mm. Yeah. There you go. There's some there's some of my some of the people that I'd love to get to know more, Daz, but Oh know. yeah, definitely. Well, I mean we're just, doing well. We're doing it's well. It's an but... amazing story, and I think as we go on through this journey, you know, you are sort of getting to know them in a way, aren't you? Yeah. You're yeah. But um I'm gonna change the subject a little bit now about um another important location oh, which yeah. was the uh, um, YMCA club is yeah. that right um, so tell us about the significance of this place uh, during that period yeah. um, is it a place where obviously I know you said that this banner wasn't created until after John Davis but John yeah. Davis did, for, for, uh, did visit this place a lot didn't he no John no I mean oh did he not well I mean I'm not. I mean, if you think about it, what the, I mean, there are several uh, pictures. I mean, and I've given you one of these souvenir booklets of the Eagle Heart. And um, mm -hmm. if people, you can Google it. There's several examples of the souvenir booklet that was created for the Eagle Heart in 1970. He was on a big plot of land. Daz, you and I have walked around mm -hmm. the, if you like, the modern day footprint of where. Yeah, the uh, Eagle Hut YMCA was built. I mean, I'm astonished that such an amazing building that housed hundreds of young uh, American soldiers who just come over in the early 1917 only lasted two or three years. But 3rd of September 1917, the London branch make their way for the official opening it had already been in operation oh i see so that's yeah. what it so john davis yeah. didn't actually go there then. yeah he did uh, so he passed away 5th of january oh, I get, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Didn't that. yeah 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 he's now i'm not saying he didn't go there because he, all the your all the movers and shakers in london you had all these different societies that you know uh, john davis you know he he'd gone to uh, Frascati's in 1913, um, where they seen a filming of the Getty, a silent um, filming of the Gettysburg film, and he was again with different American public speakers. So he did, he got around. I, you know, it's quite reasonable to assume in the process of that that John Davis may have been around. Now I've no doubt about it, but he isn't in that picture. No, am I right in saying the place was set up for the American soldiers coming yeah. over before they would go to France to fight yeah. in World War One? Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that is uh, Monday, the 3rd of September, 1917. And from our own kind of work, um, that that in, that image there, that those steps are south facing the strand. So when you and I went there, there's uh, I cannot remember the name of the church, but it's still there now in the strand. Um, but that entrance there that you see there with numerous London branch veterans um, is opposite what is now known and what was then known as Somerset House. Um, and then that picture with me on the left holding a couple of pictures. The top one is the one that you've uh, enlarged on the right. And the bottom one is Ambassador Walter Hines Page meeting the London branch veterans. That, that image there, where the stone memorial is to the Eagle Hut, that's on the north side of Bush House, and that is another entrance to what was this big bit of real estate at the bottom of the Strand. So, yeah, there's a few movers and shakers in that picture, and, again, I've managed to identify several of them. That picture, again, uh, credit to our friends in the Grand Army of Republic Memorial Museum because... That actually, um, you know, it's an important picture, but with the one we got is obviously quite high res. And uh, there's a few people that you've got Charles um, Edward Ly Lyola, right, who served on the USS Vandalia. You can see him at the bottom. He's got a cane and he's got a top hat in front of him. And he, he'd, he'd, he'd worked, that's, if you keep going with your little mate, that's him, Charles Edward Ly Lyola, right. He's buried in Kent. In item I G H T I ham, um, I'm not sure. I think it's near Tunbridge Wells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he died in 1933, and with his passing, technically was the last London branch veteran alive in London. But as you and I know, 
he wasn't the last London branch veteran. So we need to make sure we're clear on that. So, yeah, so the Eagle Hut YMCA now, um, yeah, only lasted a couple of years. And from the best of my, my, my knowledge, um, after that, it was turned over to the Metropolitan Police and then it was soon demolished. And that's where Bush House um, is now situated today. Oh. Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, so let's just uh, again go. I know you have said about the Gone Home banner. Um, yeah, but, yeah. It's, uh, you know these banners. You know, um, and what the idea was behind them, and uh, mm. you know. Well, I'm going to be honest. Obviously, the Gone Home one, and I guess on the other side of that, it says in memory, or that it were two banners, and one said Gone Home, and the other one said in memory. Um, yeah, they were first um, referenced. Um, let's have a look. I can tell you now because I've got the newspaper article. Uh, 1912, White Law Reed, uh, as a member of American and um, part of the American Embassy, uh, highly thought of by all accounts as well. And he's transported, he passes away and he's transported to the United States. And in Evening Standard correspondence talks about um, that, that experience. And he basically says, amid the distinguished from um, a group of elderly men carrying um, American flower, flags aroused curiosity as they stood by the train. There were six Civil War veterans who had come to pay their last respects to the dead ambassador. Some of their banners, which they, um, which they had, um, had inscriptions on the black bouldering next to the staff. One inscription read, Oh, yeah, in loving memory, and another gone home. And it, I can't remember if you remember, if you remember that. So when I was, because I use these pictures and I'll go through and I'll try and obviously try to see if there's anything that I've missed. You know, I managed to identify Morris Wagg because of his Medal of Honour, because he was the only London branch member with it. But yeah, John Davis carrying that gone home banner at the uh, funeral of Edward Munro in 1915. So we see it there. And unfortunately, as I say, that the, that bigger London branch banner, which really epitomises the London branch and seen in so many pictures, it's not seen before 1917, I can tell you that. I can't find any pictures of John Davis with it, but I can certainly find pictures with um, Arthur William Fraser Smith with it. Um, I'm trying to think the last time I saw it, but I can't tell you the the background behind behind it, other than the fact that it seems to have suddenly emerge from 1917. Mm -hmm. Now, unless it's some loft that wasn't, you know, it wasn't bombed in World War II, I mean, that would be a great find. Somebody in South London going, oh, I've cleared out my loft and I found this old London branch banner. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to move on to another uh, little subject now, which is, and, and again, if you're looking at the John Davis picture here, the whole yeah. bag gone home, you'll see a badge here, and I'm going to um, move to the next slide because lovely, we have yeah, examples of of we have um, an original which you managed to find, didn't you? Um, yeah. We have our mock up of it, and obviously the the picture that you sent me, yeah. Yeah. of that badge um so just tell us about the, the the significance of one of those badges and and what they you know what they represented really yeah well if you think about it so um there are different references that john davis apparently was given permission um to create their own version of a grand of like a grand army of republic style medal um but John Davis didn't mess around. So by, ja by January 1911, uh, the Southwark and Bermondsey recorder were already referencing that John has got these medals. Uh, and I was quite lucky um, to find this article quite recently. So you think, so they've had their, they've, they've formed in September 1910. They've then had the, um, then the next muster would have been yeah January the third by all accounts. So the um the, the Southern Burns Bermondsey recorder of the sixth of January wrote upon a table were displayed pictures and photos for sale and a sample of the intended badge which will be shortly provided 
and will form a beautiful ornament. Now, that original London branch badge was made uh, of sterling sil silver, rare as hen's teeth. Oh, my goodness. I'd like to scour charity shops and antique shops trying to find that elusive medal. Um, there's only one person I know who's got it, and that's a guy called Everett Bowles, who's a medal collector in the United States, and he's got a copy of it. Uh, so he's got an original of it. It was made of sterling silver, as I said, three inches uh, long, well, just over three inches, one sixteenth in length. And it was manufactured by a company called Toy & Co, who were based out of 57 Theobald's Road in, Road in Holborn in North London. So a bit of a, a distance from John Davis because it wasn't over the bridge um, from Birmingham where he lived at Blue Anchor Lane. He did have to obviously go to them. But Toy & Co... Uh, are still very much alive and well today and responsible for a manufacturer of a lot of, um, you know, medals, etc. But as you can see, I was quite lucky again when I was going through some literature that we found this high-res image of the London branch badge. And as you can see, slightly different to the American version in that the London branch one has the image of a sailor and a soldier shaking hands. And as you can see there, it says London Branch American Civil War Veterans, September the 20th, 1910. So, yeah, that's the badge. It must have cost a pretty penny to, to, to get these made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've... so how did they fund that, do you think? Don't know. Is the only answer. I mean, they could buy it. I mean, yeah. again, you know, we're talking a long time ago, I know, but yeah. you're saying it was made out of certain material. I mean, yeah. You know. Well, I mean, I'm just trying to think source material um, because I um, can't remember. I, well, you did know that I went to Oxford to find a, copies of the Anglo American Yearbook. Mm. And the Anglo-American yearbook from 1917 onwards, funny enough, when um, Arthur William Fraser Smith took over in London Branch, starts recording um, the activities of the London Branch. Um, so from 1917 onwards. Um, so the first reference is quite bland. It just says that they're, they're associated, they're, they're based in a place called Bridewell Place, which um, is... Um, I believe is it just off of Fleet Street from memory, Brightwell Place. And in 1918, um, Arthur William Fraser Smith is the um, secretary and he talks about the purpose of the London branch. And in their 1920 um, uh, edition of the Anglo-American Yearbook, it talks about the rules that were agreed, uh, um, the six rules that were agreed when the London branch was formed, which again, I'd only, I only found out quite recently. Um, but it talks about expenses, etc. It says that their, their subscription should be one shilling per quarter and membership cards were one shilling each. Um, sorry, I think one pence each. So, okay. yeah. But a lot of those member, uh, London branch members couldn't pay. And I think I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was uh, Be uh, Colonel Bevington who was one of their sort of benefactors. If it wasn't him, it was Ambrose Pomeroy, neither of which were Civil War veterans, but benefactors of the London branch. Um, I think they got the London branch was getting a bit of debt. And it, and it was they were kind of in fact, that literature that you um, just referenced on that um, uh, previous page mm -hmm. talks about how they managed to uh, they were given some donations that help to get out of debt oh, yeah. so um yeah and of course the other people who support the london branch no talk about the london branch and talk about um, john davis would never be complete without shining some light on his um uh contact with the women's relief corps in the united states as well because they mm -hmm. reached out to them quite a lot and of, of all the americans in history that have supported UK veterans in a conflict. It was the Women's Relief Corps then, and to some extent now too, as well. Yeah, amazing. Mm. Um, well, I'm going to bring up some photographs now, well, some pictures of, of, of locations <coughs> in London. And again, um, yep. 
me and Gina did do a, uh, a walk around London and visited some of these places. And there is a video on, on our YouTube channel, so go and have a look at it. It's quite a good little video, um, which I reposted up a little while ago because I made a spelling mistake uh, with John's name. But um, anyway, that's a good little video. Go and watch it. But the first one is, of course, uh, George Washington. Yeah. And of course, I didn't know George Washington was even in London until I turned up on that day. And Gina said, well, this is the first stop. <laughs> And uh, of course, we recreated a lot of those photographs. But um, yeah, so the, you know, um, so they got around London a bit, didn't they? These uh, veterans, you know, these places. Mm. And also, if you think about it, they were seen to give them front row seats at some of these events. I mean, look, yeah, but all those cl- clouds, crowds looking on behind the railings. You've got Arthur William Fraser Smith, who maintains his position as honourable secretary, laying a wreath there that day. Um, we've been to that statue because it's just in um, front of, is it, I think it's one that, is it a Tate Gallery, a uh, Tate Gallery it's, or it's, something? It's somewhere just, it, there, yeah. yeah, it's just that, the, 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 for people who want to go and see where that statue is, it's not far from sort of the West End and uh, West End, and it's right on the top um, northern corner of Trafalgar Square. You can't really miss it. Um so yeah, there we there are quite a few photographs of the London branch after Arthur laid that wreath, stood in front of that photograph, um, and I'm sure that I've read somewhere that that statue was placed on soil that came from Virginia, because apparently George Washington vowed that he'd never step foot in England again. Yeah, and so we again another place we visited, and this is actually from our visit. This uh, yeah. Thing was somerset house now obviously he was talking about the eagle hut just a minute ago yeah and again yeah. so um ladies and gentlemen um you got a picture that behind us would have been the eagle hut yeah. and the london branch are walking from somerset house across this yeah and again the idea was to try and recreate those pictures wasn't it and it was yeah. such a fantastic day yeah. yeah yeah so if any anybody's interested um if they go to the strand find those arches at somerset house and dialogue directly opposite. Can't remember the name of the small little street, but but that little street is still there now. So where you got that crowd on the right hand side of the picture, that's more or less where the street starts. But back in the day, that would do. You've got where 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 we that original nineteen seventeen photograph was taken um, is the entrance where you saw those veterans on the stairs, um, earlier on in the presentation. And, 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 you know, that was a very, very enjoyable day to, to, to go and do all that really. Um, I, I, it's a little yeah. bit unexpected because I, I wasn't, I didn't realize that we was going to do that, you know, yeah, and, uh, it yeah. was quite, a, quite a nice, uh, you know, day. Mm. Uh, I'd like to re I'd like to re- try and recreate I, that. I think I think we could definitely do that. Uh, yeah. That's definitely in the near future. And then, of course, there's uh, so there's some other photographs I've got here uh, of some of the older photographs. And uh, we we did actually visit this church as well, didn't we? Yeah. So that is the uh, oh no, this one is the Lincoln Tower. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So the Lincoln so Tower. I'm getting confused. Yeah. yeah the right. Lincoln Tower was um, funded, can't remember by the name of the person, but basically he was a, uh, uh, an abolitionist uh, preacher, was English born, and they built the Lincoln Tower, and it's still there today, although all the structure that you see around it in that original picture no longer exists. But you can just see at the bottom, it says W.C. Paul, and the Reverend W.C. Paul, is in that picture on uh, the right hand side so you can see him with his uh the white dog collar there and you've got elizabeth swart out and she was from the women's relief corps uh so you've got john locke on the left the reverend wc paul who also became a member of the london branch um so he was definitely the president of the london branch in 1929 according to the anglo-american yearbook Yes, yeah, so you've got John Locke, W.C. Paul. You've got uh, oh, oh, I'm trying to think of her first name, but um, you've got Elizabeth Swartout. Then you've got um, one of the embassy staff. Can't remember his name. Then you've got Arthur W. Fraser Smith. Then you've got a lady friend of our, um, Charles Edward 
um, Loyola Wright, who stood there with his cane. And I can't remember the name of the young schoolboy there. But that picture is taken at the foot of that church, the Lincoln Tower. And so, again, we, we you and I haven't walked in those footsteps. But no, I we haven't. Haven't. no, sorry, yeah. I'm getting confused because I think... Um, we did go to a church, we, day, we, we went to a different church, didn't we? Yeah, and I, for yeah. some reason, I saw that picture and I, I thought it was the same one. But um, yeah, no, the church, the church, yeah, the church that we went to would be, would be known is equally as well known because it's St Bride's Fleet Street and the, yeah. the church tower of St Bride's Fleet Street. Number one, mm-hmm. I know why I, I took you there because it's got an old Roman road in the. That's crib. right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. it's got no connection to the London branch then, actually. Um, other than the fact that by no, the accounts yeah, sorry, I've, I've read got, is that I've the got... London branch walked up Fleet Street, so they would have gone past St Bride's Fleet Street mm-hmm. um, to get to um, where the Eagle Hut YMCA was. But but again, these are all physical places that you know mm. uh, people can go and visit. And I think in the near future, um, ladies and gentlemen, there will be some kind of reference book hopefully yeah, in the future yeah. but that, that's in the future um but yeah. let's move on to a really really important location and we've definitely definitely been here a few times oh, yes and, and that is of course abraham lincoln that's in yeah. Parliament Square. now there's a lot of americans that don't actually know that this is 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 in london you know i yeah. mean um, they don't they, they stumble across it and, and yeah. i've even been standing there when americans have walked past and and they're like what the why is that there? You know, they, yeah. they they can't get their head around it. But yeah, so this was really important to the London branch, this, this particular um, monument, wasn't it? Yeah. So um, they were, now I'm just trying to find you, not, July the 28th, 1920, I'm reading the newspaper article. That's when the statue was inaugurated. And it became a focal point for the London branch for many years thereafter. That first day, there is um, a, a, a nice picture of the London branch um, where there, there stood, and you can tell that it's raining, and it was chucking it down with rain uh, this July, um, this date in midsummer in 1920. Not dissimilar to right now, Daz, because it is chucking it down with rain outside as if on cue but yeah with um but interestingly and i can't remember if we there was something not right about these pictures so that middle one that is that building uh from memory is what i used to know as the middle middlesex guild hall crown court and i'd been there several times in my service and what i couldn't work out is the position of that statue and what happened is in the late 1940s early 1950s parliament square was reconfigured and how dare they they moved the statue of abraham lincoln so that where where it's facing so say for example where that picture on the right hand side where it's facing us in 21st century parliament square would be turned you know um a quarter turn left so it's facing into parliament square it took me ages to work that out and it took a bit of detective work but yeah you can see so in that third picture i've just referenced you've got um oh uh putnam who was um a, a, a civil war veteran a publisher who um would come along and he was a big ben- benefactor of the london branch uh, that one's going to be a quite late one because you can see there's hardly any veterans in that one. And you've got Arthur William Fraser Smith um, with his banner. The one in the middle, there's quite a few names known to me then. Um, I've got a feeling William Blaze is in that one. So if he's in it, he, I think he died in 1921. Um, you've got James Stanford Cook, right the far left, who served with George Custer. Um, you've got Charles Edward Loyola Wright, in it as well you've got a few people in there that i recognize um it's just i've got um let's have a quick look and then that image you see on the far left that is that's wartime i think that was about 1942 and again because of its position you can see that it's pointing it's almost like pointing towards westminster abbey if that makes sense rather than pointing towards as it now does um towards 
big Ben. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but, it, yeah I, it's, it's the very cool. place. Yeah, yeah, it's nice because I mean, you have I, you and I have been there, and I think for as long as I, I can be involved in the monumental project and doing what we're doing, it almost becomes a. Uh, a mission that we should, you know, pay our respects there. We're all, almost doing the work of the London branch because they can't do it anymore. Yeah, of course. So, so yeah, so there you go. And and of course, you did lay a wreath uh, on the uh, Remembrance Sunday, didn't you? Yeah, last? I think we've done one yeah. for Memorial Day. That's so right. Far. Yeah. And then yeah, because we've only been going two years, haven't we? And then mm -hmm. we did one yeah. for uh, yeah, we missed Memorial Day last year in fact i think the year brief before we're still in covid anyway so my might, might not might not have been as easy but we right. certainly did one this this may and we certainly did one um last year on remembrance sunday mm -hmm. so we're there. and we're obviously we're doing it i know the uh, men's on john davis sunday union veterans of the civil war do it so it's nice to yeah they, they lay reef as well yeah so, yeah you know, it's, it's, it's like, a focal point isn't it for yeah. that connection you know, yeah, yeah. to the Civil War and their 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 last in legacy. But I'm going to change and switch the focus again back to John Davis because yeah. um, I know you did mention a little bit about um, him uh, being uh, robbed, but um, yeah. you, you gave me this little news article. Oh yeah, and I uh, just wanted you to give us a little bit of more context. Uh, yeah, but it's going to again give you the measure of him as well. I mean, I have no, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a bit of a temper on him. But this is one look. I mean, how a man of God treats those who rob him. John Davis conducts the service at Geddon Street Mission and has issued the following notice. If even one of the whole four men who hustled me cut my pocket and took my purse with, was it 23 shillings, in, in, in will come and see me and allow me to have a little talk with one or more of them for five short minutes, I promise them on my oath as a man of God, I will freely forgive them. And they shall never hear of it again. There he goes. He was going. That just encapsulates him, doesn't it? Yeah, but yeah. The yeah. more and more I learn about him myself, I just I've got so much admiration for this this yeah. man. Yeah, you know? I I mean, I'm not going to be narcissistic and think that what we're doing is you know that we're the best thing since sliced bread in what we're doing. I just feel as though we're perhaps. I don't know filling a gap in the market. I mean, if that's the best phrase, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing. We're trying to honour these veterans by raising awareness, raising monuments and just keeping their memory alive. And I, and I would hope that John Davis, if he's looking down on what we're doing, is happy with what we're, we're doing and uh, perhaps would give us some words of encouragement. I, I think there is some divine intervention going on somewhere. Yeah. The way. I really yeah. do. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, I'm going to move on to the sad you know, news of his passing now yeah. as well. And, so, you know, because he did pass away, didn't he? So just tell us a little bit about that and how that went down and, you know, um, what was the response from the community, uh, particularly in, in Bermondsey, when they lost this this amazing... Uh, well, um, 5th of January, 1917, um, he passes away. I'm just going to see if I can find reference to it because his son, Charles, um, wrote about it. Um and you know, I can't find it now, which is unfortunate because I did have it printed off. Um, ah, yeah, so he dies, um, he dies on the 5th of January 1917. Now, one would think that a man who'd been he retires from his position as the London as a missionary for the um London City Mission in 1915, so he's been doing it since about 1877. So he, he's given he's given quite a bit of service you know, to his role as a missionary. But by 1915, he gives the role up and he, he um, retires. Um, 5th of January, he dies, uh, 1917. But you, one would think that for a man who's done so much in the community, he would get a headstone, but he's buried in a, a public grave with uh, several other people in Nunhead. And, and that's for him... You know, despite, you know, all these words written about his endeavours, he, he doesn't get a headstone for many, many, many years later until I think it's about 2016 when uh, that was around when the Ensign John Davis, Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War uh, camp, he gets a charter and becomes a camp in its own right. So they name, name themselves after John Davis. But 
what I do like is the fact that he was remembered by his London branch uh, veterans at his um, funeral on the 11th of January. And it almost become, you know, this statement that he made about many a time that I, I, I met other veterans in the consulate and said that we'd just like to have the honour of a, a, a flag and remembrance on the day we died. Well, that came to be at his um, funeral because his son Charles wrote to the Women's Relief Corps just to let them know of his death. His son Charles was living in Canada at the time. And he wrote to the Women's Relief Corps because they normally got some correspondence from John Davis because he regularly updated them on what they were doing, uh, particularly as they were giving donations to the London branch as well. But Charles wrote, my father was ill, but three days. He asked me to look after his poor vessions, which I did to the best of my ability. And there were 15 at the funeral and six at the cemetery. It was an impressive sight when the old men came up with their flag and waved it over his grave and said, here's the old flag you served under, John. God bless you. We will miss your dear face, but we know you, we will meet you in heaven. So I guess that he became the architect of something that actually in the end had a, a positive ripples for other people, but it also offered him that benefit of getting that flag that he originally sought in 1910 for the other veterans and did get it over his grave. And whilst perhaps shy of nearly 100 years went by, eventually when his family members and other interested parties turn up to, they, they managed to get him a, a burial marker in Nunhead Cemetery many years later. So it's kind of the, the mission was complete in honouring him with the, with that that headstone. So, yeah, the London branch certainly, uh, you know, lost quite a champion of their cause when he died in 1917. But it's important to say that Arthur Frazier Smith was no less a champion of the cause. I'm always interested that these veterans, though, either met Abraham Lincoln or were present at the surrender of the Confederate forces with, you know... Wait, um, it you know, yeah. Simon says in that news article there, he was involved with, um, you know, the, 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 the John Wilkes Booth, you know, yeah. the guy that murders yeah. Abraham Lincoln, you know. Yeah. I mean, whether that's a bit tongue-in-cheek, yeah. but... He, yeah, he, maybe. He, yeah, but I'm going to allow them that. It's not for me to, to say so, that he didn't. Yeah, of course, yeah. And uh, anyway, so um, that's John Davis and the London Branch Civil War Veterans. But let's shift gears again and let's talk about um what's uh, you know a little bit of an update on the monuments for uk veterans and americans yeah. association because you know been a busy time hasn't it we've had um mm. one dedication so far this year we've got another one coming up again soon um yeah. which yeah. is amazing and you had a like you mentioned earlier had a little visit to do some research in oxford yeah. so yeah do you want to give us a little bit of an overview of what's been going on lately yep yeah. so um I'm hopefully, as the winter months come along, going to write a book all about the London branch um, from the day, but kind of a prehistory, um, because if you read the letters of these pensioners, uh, sorry, these veterans in London before the London branch, it just screams and this, the, the need for the branch, which eventually happened, because they, they were treated quite harshly by the Pension Bureau in America. So to cut long story short, my initial plan is to do a story about the London branch um, and try and, you know, join the dots as much as I can. I'm sure there's other academics out there that may know more than me, but I'm giving you my best guess as to what I've established today, because... As I say, our mantra is not just about raising monuments, about raising awareness too. And I don't want to have all this knowledge without passing it on to others. But so in the in the pipeline at the moment is the the the, the groundwork for book three. There's some other potential uh, writings in the pipeline as well that I know you and I have spoke about. Mm -hmm. But that trip there was the Bodleian Library in Oxford. That was I had to do that trip over several days. Lovely place. And even managed to find a Civil War veteran who who, who um, lived in Oxford. In fact, a couple of veterans. Um, 
but you can see there i was at the bodland library to find the only complete set of the anglo-american yearbook which ran from 1913 to 1961 to get um the kind of accounts of the london branch up until uh arthur fraser smith passed away and then there was no reference to him then so um that's where i am on the book uh in terms of headstones applications um i'll quickly tell you that while i'm thinking about it so um today i'm sending off the it's been approved by the cemetery in brighton an application for the headstone, uh, sorry, the foot marker uh, for John Heath, who was on the USS Owasco, uh, who got uh, wounded in action 13 times down in Galveston, um, and then decided to re-enlist in a fake name after being wounded 13 times. And then after his service in, um, on the, in the Civil War, then comes back to Brighton, becomes a police officer. Um, so we just I'm just about to send off his application. We've got John Taplin on the 16th of October in Hendon Cemetery, who was um, on the USS Morning Light. And I haven't checked in on it yet, but we've also applied for um, the headstone for Samuel Lander Howe, who died in December 1940, who was also a member of the London branch. And with his passing, effectively the London branch in terms in forms of veterans alone um, ended um, and it's interesting actually because if you see in those pictures that that's our display at Detling this year the military odyssey event which took place down in Kent where I was very quite proud and quite touched that Soscan and the American Civil War Society members agreed to portray 111 Pennsylvania volunteers during their time down in Chattanooga. And uh, not only did we upgrade our display to make it a bit more visible and, uh, you know, to, to visually tell a story of the veterans that we seek to honour, but I had an opportunity to give an account of George and some of the other London-based veterans who'd also served in the 111th too. So it was quite an honour, really. And we did raise money there. And in terms of our fundraising, we've raised up with the help, the recent help of the American Civil War Roundtable. Um, we've raised um, football well, that they, they've donated four thousand. I'm um, sorry, four hundred pounds. So we're we're approximately four thousand three hundred pounds, and we're currently exploring getting the um, uh, the, the sculpture that Stuart Stephanie's created um, cast in metal, and mm. then so yeah. Just trying yeah, to think it's, what been, else. it's 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 gone from strength to strength this year. I I yeah, think it's yeah. getting stronger and and uh, the message mm. is getting out there, isn't it? And uh, mm. again, you know, you've worked really really hard on the display. You you you've adapted it as a uh, as the reenacting season went on, didn't you? Um, mm. Yeah, it was having issues with wind and weather, <laughs> wind. And all sorts of stuff. You know, <laughs> uh, when I say wind, guy, I mean that kind of wind. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Trying to feed me a uh, French Calvados all season. Yeah. Um, still not going to drink. But, um, yeah. you know, I mean, you really have done an amazing job in, 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 and, and, and the best thing about the new display is that it's, you know, it's self contained and you don't have to actually be there. No, you know, you no, I think. Leave it, you know. Yeah. It's fantastic. Not that we're not interested, but. No, of course it, you know, not. No, but. but we've got those. Yeah. When we've got you're doing the enactments. You can't always be there. No. And, uh, no. So it, it speaks for itself, basically. Yeah, because we've got those trifold flyers that we made yeah. in the last year. Mm -hmm. We've got quite a few of the pension books that tell the individual stories of veterans. We've got the donation box if people want to donate. And we do want people to, to donate. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an entirely self-funding endeavour. Um, but, yeah, you know, the raising monuments, raising awareness is really important, uh, you know, in equal measures, as it were, yeah. you know, but we're not going to go away even once we raise that single monument to all the veterans where our work will continue with the individual members and, and i'm hopeful because of obviously off the the back of the american civil war society uh members coming down to detlin that we can create um you know some friendship there and some ties and allow us to honor those veterans who perhaps don't live as close to us but in fact, off the back of some recent um, posts that we did on Facebook, 
I've just found that the, one of the sec, the secretary of the American Civil War Society may be actually related to one of the veterans that I posted up about quite recently. And I mean, that'd be wonderful because if we can, you know, that really makes it much more relevant, especially if you've got somebody who's in American Civil War Society, a living historian, turns out that they're connected to, uh, you know, a real, li- a real live but dead uh, veteran in the American Civil War. Yeah. So, yeah, lots to be done. Lots, to be, lots, oh, to lot, be... lot, lots to look forward to. And I just yeah. want to echo what you just said and, and, um, and give my thanks to all the uh, Southern Skirmish Association members that, mm. that took part in that, uh, the ACWS members. And like you said, the donation from the American Civil War Roundtable UK, we thank you so much. Um, mm. Just going to move on to the last thing now. Again, if people do want to donate, Gina, just tell them how they go about that and how can yeah. they find the Monuments for UK Veterans and the American Civil War Association? Okay, so we've got a bank account, um, and I can't remember the bank account details, but there are two other ways. They can, we've got the Just Giving uh, link. Uh, I think we're up to about um, £230, £240 on the Just Giving link. That one's just to um, try and raise £2,000 to, again, give us some resilience in the project that we're doing because we want to make sure that the monument that we're doing is going to be befitting the people that we seek to honour. We don't want to do a half-cocked, the half-measured monument and especially for the amount of effort that um, Stuart Stephanie's put into it. So they can donate to our Just Giving page or Civil War UK Monumental Project at gmail.com is not only our email address, uh, which should be on uh, Linktree, but it's also our um, PayPal address as well. So people can PayPal us as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and um, if people actually want to return on the investment as well, well, we've got several bits of merchandise. We've got stickers. We've got copies of that London branch uh, badge. If people want to get uh, something that can become a talking piece as well. We've got small pins, uh, which are like the original Grand Army of the Republic um, pin as well. So there are at least two ways. There are three ways. And even um, we've also got a card reader now because, remember, we decided at um, public shows people don't always carry cash with them. So we've got a card reader now for future events. And so people can tap and donate as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so yeah. that's where that's where we're at. I'm assuming 235 is where we are. Um, if you've taken that screenshot, there's I'm assuming that's yes, where we I, are. I, yeah, I took that off the web off of our yeah. uh, just giving so, page. Yeah, so it's been a bit quiet lately, but um, but we do obviously want people to support us, and I appreciate that not everybody has money, but it doesn't cost anything to share a post, mm-hmm. and by sharing a post on your social media, it will obviously expand the reach of what we're doing you know and obviously as we said it's about raising awareness not just raising monuments as well yeah. but by raising awareness you might be helping us to raise a monument anyway because people might somebody else might want to donate so yeah that's where we are anyway i just want to just uh ask you one more little question so what yes. is john davis's lasting legacy hmm, i believe in rippling and I always feel about that John Davis, my mum often says this, because obviously George Denham is her great grandfather. She, she always says about, she wonders if these veterans could ever conceive the idea that two individuals with a harebrained idea in early 2021 would think, oh, why don't we form an association mm. to honour all veterans? But I've got to say, when I found George Denham, I ended up finding John Davis, James Henry Cleggett, Arthur William Fraser Smith. I found you. I found the American Civil War Society. I found so That is what John Davis's legacy is because I couldn't ignore him. When you read what he's done, when you read his exploits, when you read about his life, and he was a pretty interesting character. I think he'd... Now, for the fact that obviously there's technology and stuff, I think he'd probably be quite a mover and shaker in the world that we live in now. He'd be a, 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 quite an entertainer. You know, could you imagine sitting around a campfire at a sauce can events with John Davis? Oh, wow. Yeah. 
So but that is what his legacy is. Yeah, he is created a ripple, and that ripple has kind of washed over us and perhaps other people. Because by, by doing what we're doing, we've got to meet other people. My life is quite interesting. Not that it wasn't interesting, but I do believe. Oh, I've liked the last couple of years. It's, it's fascinating. It's interesting. And I've never, I've never been a living historian in terms of the American Civil War. But I feel, you know, when I come along to the Soscan events and I see people wearing the blue suit and people portraying Confederates and I stood in those woods at Detley and I'm seeing people wear the white star of the 111th. It puts, you know, like makes me shiver. It puts the, the hair up on the back of my head. That is what his legacy is. Uh-huh. That, you know, that he, 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 that for him, perhaps getting a headstone or a burial marker was that, you know, the, the unfinished business that was concluded in 2016. But his endeavors go on, perhaps because of because of the man that he was. If he hadn't, you know, the, like I said, the Grand Army Republic, whilst they were great, somehow didn't have what John Davis had in 1910. You know, he in 1910 had this idea that somehow, for some reason, the Grand Army of the Republic could not pull off in 1909 with Joseph Emerson Yule. I'm not sure why. Joseph Emerson Yule, who was a veteran himself, uh, I believe a commander in chief, you know, was, um, you know, in his own way, quite a mover and shaker. But something happened in Liverpool and it's lost to history, but they didn't create a Grand Army of the Republic post. It's been lost to history. So why was it that John Davis managed to, what was it? That he, you think about it, Daz, he managed to achieve what nobody else did. Nobody else in England created any, there was only one London branch, there was no other branches. That is what his legacy. Let's not play down the the efforts that he put and the endeavours that he did. I no wonder he needed to retire by 1915. <laughs> That's his legacy. I'm going to leave yeah. it there. Thank you. And I just want to say, ladies and gentlemen, um, obviously we refer to a lot of pictures during this podcast. So if you are listening via the podcast, then please hop over to the YouTube channel so you can see the pictures we were talking about. And all that's left to say is, Gina, thank you very much. Thank you, Daz. It's an absolute pleasure.